And good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on your timeline. Uh, it's nice to see seeing everybody again. Uh, it's not the first time I was with you guys. It's the second time, and hopefully it will not be the last time. And uh, I've discussed the matter quite a few times with, uh, with, uh, with Fernanda and also David Braun, who uh, ran away from us today. He preferred to go to the Formula One rally than to listen to me, but that's uh, his prerogative. Um, I, I'm a thematic collector, a thematic exhibitor, and um, I've got an FIP gold, basically 93, po 93 points and uh, quite a few special prizes uh, for treatment, basically, um, and that kind of thing. And I've been exhibiting for many, many years. And today, today I'm going to tell you, tell you the story of how I got to the gold by telling a story I'm going to do it by showing you some of the items that many judges uh, can miss because they don't know what rarity is about, what the rarity and the condition, because uh, you talk about modern material, well, you'll see when we come, when we get to it. Okay, and uh, now why is it not coming forward? Okay, a little bit about myself. Okay. I'm a system analyst and a senior programmer. I always ask them at work if I'm a senior programmer because I'm old or because I've been in the job for a long, long time. I'm also an author. Uh, my book is being sold on Amazon. I'm, uh, I also did a course in, to be an official gymnasium trainer. And I taught, uh, I taught people, I actually taught the trainers. And I'm a blogger, of course, and I'm a YouTuber. And you'll hear more about that later. And it's even a QR code here if you code if you want to follow me later. Now, of course, I started when I was young. I started when I was five, and not everyone started that year, that young, but it means that I've been almost uh, six decades uh, been collecting. And I got into it because, because of my father. And I spoke to somebody today who was uh, he's a little bit younger than I am, but he's uh, He's a collector, his father was a collector, his grandfather was a collector, and his grandfather's father was a collector, in other words, his great-grandfather. So it's a whole uh, dynasty, but his children are not collectors. I'm trying to convince my little girl to become a collector, and I've started with uh, postcards. At the moment, I'm doing okay with that. Um, before, before I went into the army, I went to, went to university, and uh, this is where basically my own story starts, because I was not born in Israel. I was born in a country called Rhodesia, which today it's called Zimbabwe. And growing up in Rhodesia, I was faced with a lot of anti-Semitism, an unbelievable anti-Semitism. Um, I was in the top grades at school, and people didn't like it that a Jew happened to be one of the top five at school. I was also in the, in the uh, city rugby, rugby, rugby team, and that was also a no-no, and there were quite a lot of uh, fights as a result of that. And what broke me was that when my best friend at school, who was not uh, Jewish, turned to me and said to me, uh, Hitler should have called, killed more of us. And that was when I decided that... Uh, Rhodesia was no longer the place for me to live, and I emigrated to Israel. I finished my schooling in Israel, and uh, then went to university, and uh, off to the army. And as I said, that is, where the, that is where the story starts. Because while I was in the army, I happened to be on, um, in Lebanon. And while I, was in, while I was in Lebanon, I happened to be in one of the houses, and I saw the stamp. Now, this time, I didn't know what it was because I was, in, because I was a, a, a private, in other words, a very lowly soldier. I couldn't do anything about it. I saw this letter on, a, on an envelope. Here we see the map of Israel, the map of Palestine, whatever you want to call it, with a, with a dagger right in the middle of it with blood. You can see all this here and it's very, very vivid. And it's actually, in my eyes are beautiful. But I had no idea what this was. I mean, all it says here is Delia Sin Massacre, a date which is 9th, the 9th of April, 1948. And sorry, am I talking too fast? No? Okay. Um, April, 9th, 9th of April, 1948, and I had no idea what it was. But the image was so beautiful, I knew I had to start doing that. 
because there as a collector, I was getting stamped from all over the world, put it into an envelope. And when I was at school, it was already boring. When I went to university, it was boring. And when I started the army, it was almost a dying, should I say. If I had not had seen this item, I would have gone and given up many, many years ago. Anyway, I got home and I started looking at uh, the stamp catalog that I had at the time, which was Gibbons because I didn't know anything else. And I found there are many other countries who've made certain similar stamps. Algeria, Egypt, and also Gaza, Iraq, Jordan, and all, all, the, all these countries brought out a similar stamp. And I found them and I said, this is what I need to start collecting. This I love. So all of a sudden now I had a topic. I, I knew what I wanted to collect. I collected Arab philatelic propaganda against Israel, because if you look at that, it's a beautiful item. It's full of propaganda, the blood, the blood spatter, the, the map of Israel, Palestine, which basically in those days, it was a map including what is today um, the West Bank. In other words, it was before the West Bank was separated or became a part of the Israel proper. So it's basically the map of Israel as it is today. And that was where at a time when it were, the West Bank was not a part of Israel. So it got me thinking about a lot of things that I didn't know anything about. And in those days, and I'm talking about 1982, there was no internet. The internet was only that we know of. That we know of, it was basically only in 1992. And basically, I couldn't even converse with anybody in the Arab world. So I had no one to discuss this with. And I had a real problem. Because it's actually, if you go into the ATA in those days, there was, no, there was no catalog that said the Arab-Israeli conflict, because how do you define it? It's uh, something I was thinking about, or Arab military propaganda. And I decided to make my own catalog. And by after a few years, obviously, as we have in almost every, every collection, after a few years, I have every stamp on the list, because basically we're talking about something that is 1948 onwards. So it was not, a diff not very difficult to get all the stamps. But it's a, it's a subject that I love. And you can see, you can see another, another modern stamp. This is from 2001. And just look at the beauty in the stamp. You can see here the black, which is the color of, the de of death. And you can see the blood at the top here, the blood here coming, uh, spilling down. And you can see uh, the, what is it, what we call it? The Omar Mosque, basically, sorry, the Dome of the Rock, which is not Al-Aqsa Mosque. Many people think that this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It is not. It's the Dome of the Rock. And we have the, we see here the, the um, barbed wire, and the barbed wire is broken. And we see here a kid throwing a rock at a tank. Now, the kid throwing a rock at the tank, this is basically very similar to what was happening in Tiananmen Square in China in 1988. It's the same kind of imagery. And this is something that I enjoy. I love looking at this. I love the imagery. And I want, to do, I want to talk about that. But, you know, when you want to talk about that, I also want to talk about what's anti-Jewish because of what happened to me as a kid. And this is one of the items that are very close to my heart, my heart because here we see the Jew as a snake and trying to stop it. Now, this is also, this, is, this actually stamp was brought out in 1941 in Nazi-occupied Serbia. <clears throat> now, Nazi-occupied Serbia brought out this stamp as anti-Masonic and anti-Jewish exhibition. And here we have the anti-Masonic um, the Masonic um, emblem. You can see everything, and it's very, very nice. And we, this um, imagery we see also on, we see later in an, an, a stamp brought out by Austria uh, for Never Forget. But in this time, it's Nazi which becomes a snake. This same imagery was used later in, in, um, by, uh, by um, Arab, say, Arab terrorist organizations in their imagery to say that Jews are a snake or whatever. And this image is very good. But because I can't, because I, because I cannot show the opposing side, in other words, um, Israeli propaganda, because basically it isn't any, I decided to talk about my exhibit and how I started. Because now I had a topic, the Arab, the, the Arab propaganda. So the next thing I want to do is to exhibit. So I started exhibiting, okay, and I'm talking about 1990. And this is what I exhibited 
all the stamps of, of Diriasin, they're all of the same, very beautiful. But on the other hand, who really wants to see an exhibit page like that? So uh, now we have a problem because the, my mentor in those days was an American. He says, this is how you're supposed to show the topic. So my title in those days was Arab-Israeli Conflict. And I added a frame of public service. Now, for those people who don't know what public service is, here's an example. It's a letter that was sent to Israel, but somehow landed up in an Arab country. And because many Arab countries didn't have postal relations in Israel, it received public service. And in this one is Avek Israel. In other words, no relations with Israel. Um, which is also, in a way, this is also part of the conflict. So now, once it's on the horizon of part of the conflict, and uh, it's not only stamps, I'm bordering here on not a, not a topic, but some kind of theme. And those days in 1990, uh, thematics was not very well developed in Israel. And fortunately, I got a bronze medal. But I'm, I think in those days that I probably got a bronze medal because of the last frame not because of the bond material. And this is a bit of an interesting part of that. When I exhibited in 1990, when I exhibited the Arab-Israeli conflict, it was one of the first times that people had seen this, these kind of stamps in Israel. I mean, I was collecting it. And what happens often in, in, when you're collecting, people don't see these stamps. Uh, Fernando, for example, is going off now to, to Cape Town, and I believe he's going to exhibit their um, denazification and something that people don't know about it. Once you have something at home and you don't, ex don't show it, don't exhibit it, and no one knows about it. And it's beautiful to show these things. So when I was, when I was um, mounting my frame and um, there were many, many people there, Arabs, Jews, whatever, who were helping mount the frame. And all of a sudden I was surrounded by all kinds of people looking at these stems and it gave me a wonderful feeling. And maybe because of that wonderful feeling, um, 42 years ago, not, not so long, 32 years ago, that I'm still exhibiting today because the wonderful people when a feeling when people stop by your exhibit and then throw by it and you want, you want to explain things. But in those days I had no good advice. As I said, my only mentor was an American and he had American knowledge. And basically American exhibiting is different from FIP exhibiting. The rules are different. And sometimes it's a little bit less lenient. Now, what I, when I discussed with my mentor, uh, we decided to take the same stamps that I had and find, look for them on covers. And this is what we found: a stamp that the first, the first three, the, the first three stamps here. Uh, yeah, let's just put them here. These are also discussing the the intifada or the uprising. This one says, "Okay, let us let us free Palestine from in the Middle East from Libya." And this was, you know, basically we we're just hearing about some kind of peace treaty with, Le with Lebanon about the borders or whatever. And this was a peace treaty that was actually about to be signed in 1982 between Israel and, um, and Lebanon. And Libya did everything it could to uh, abolish that treaty and eventually was never signed. You see that? I didn't know this and I exhibited this and I didn't know this at the time, but this, actually, this letter is actually philatelic. Now, you can say to Philatelic because you can see the stamps used, uh, souvenir sheet, and everything with the same, with the same um, um, subject. And Nick Macris was uh, basically the head of a, the, the manager of a, of a company called Perfect Perf, which was a dealer in Arab world stamps. I didn't buy it from him, I bought it from somebody else, but I realized this afterwards when I was a little bit more advanced that this is not really a nice cover for an exhibit. It's a lovely cover for a collection, but not an exhibit. But it gave me a large silver, so I was happy. My tail was wagging. Now I started to turning, as I told you, the public service already started turning into some kind of thematic collector. Now, um, when I was talking to Yoram uh, a few days ago, we were discussing what is the difference between a, to a topic exhibit and a thematic exhibit. Um, when you have, uh, for example, if you have, a, if you want to, uh, if you want to collect snakes, you collect everything about snakes. If the snake appears on the bottom, in the top left corner, or in the salvage or whatever, that's kind of something that you put in your collection. But if you want to collect a theme, 
then you also start collecting items depicting mice. Why mice? Because um, snakes eat mice. So it all, it's all of a sudden you, you're getting out of your, um, your, your sideline. You're getting new material. And when you exhibit, you have to have a diversity of material. As, uh, so. Now, also requires a plan. You have to think about what you're going to say. You can't say, okay, I'm going to do, um, if I talk about snakes, snakes, uh, snakes in, the, in, the, in the culture, snakes with men, uh, what do snakes eat, all that kind of thing. It's kind of like a textbook. So you think about the plan. So I didn't say Arab Israel conflict. I thought about the creation of Israel and the struggle for survival. Now, struggles for survival or acceptance, part of service is already part of that because you're not, Israel is not accepted in the Arab world. We're all the time struggling for survival and acceptance. So I had talked about the, uh, the Southern Declaration of Statehood. The years that followed, the Declaration of Statehood was 1948 and the, the War of Independence, and the following wars, 1956, 1967, 1970, and so on and so forth. And I searched for peace. And basically I had some kind, of, some kind of item that I wanted to talk about. You can say basically that in a way that's almost like a history book. And that was basically what I was thinking on the lines of. But then I decided to add the lack of recognition and boycotts and Public service is a kind of lack of recognition. And economic boycotts, we see that all the time. We see it in sports boycotts because, as we know, uh, Israel doesn't take part in, it takes part in Eurovision because it can't take part in anything of Asia because you're not accepting part of Asia or the Middle East. Uh, if we will be up to until the Abraham Accords, we weren't even able to take part in stamp exhibitions in the Middle East. Today, we're almost, um, we're almost there, not yet, but we're getting there. And we took part in all these uh, European, European things. We're a member of EuroLeague as far as sports and whatever. So there's a kind of item here that we're having a, a problem with a uh, struggle for survival of our, of, our, of our existence. And of course, I have to talk about the Holocaust because the Holocaust is basically uh, the catalyst for the creation. It was the, because of the Holocaust, it was then that it had to be created because it's basically in those days, there was also an, almost nowhere for Jews to go to. It was proven before the Holocaust when in, um, in a ship that, uh, that set sail uh, with, with people that set sail from Germany and no, one would, no country apart from the Dominican Republic would let Jews land there. Okay, so we know that that was basically one of the issues. And someone then said to me, I have to do the British mandate as well. Why the British mandate? Because the British mandate was what led up to the, the Declaration of Statehood. And you can go further and further and further and discuss this. And these are items that, that took my the topic, the topic exhibit to become a thematic exhibit. And this game brought me into a Vermeil exhibit, into a Vermeil, and I was very, very happy. Very, very happy. And I got, in 2008, I got another Vermeil. 2000, Israel in 2008. But, but I had a problem again. I had a problem all of a sudden. I'm stuck at a Vermeil. A Vermeil in, in, in thematic exhibiting is between 80 and 85. 84 points, sorry. And I was stuck in the middle there, 82, 83 points. And, you know, you're stuck there. You have to know what to do. And an Argentinian... Uh, the judge, I don't even remember what his name was, uh, came to me and said to gave me the critique and he said to me, be serious with your exhibit. And I did not know what he meant. I had no idea. And but you know, when you when someone says that you have to think about actually what he's saying. And so I, just, I approached a, an Israeli a judge and he said to me, forget the material, write the plan, write the story, only then look for the material. If you have it, you have it. If you don't have it, look for it. And that's what I did. I did, did an entire rewrite of my entire exhibit. I forgot about everything, and I just wrote, wrote a story. In 2009, one year later, I got my first large mail in China. And Ron, when I was there in 2009, that same Argentinian judge said to me, now I want to see the same thing in eight frames. He said, now keep this up over eight frames. That's not so easy. It's not an easy task. But with this new exhibit, 
I was now stuck at uh, stuck at large for mail. 2000, 2008, I got uh, 2009, got my first one, and you continue and continue. You all the time get the same the same results. And I knew I needed to move to eight frames because the Argentinian judge already told me they had to. Basically, in essence, if you get a large for mail, um, after a few times you should move to eight frames. And after a certain period of time, as far as my understanding, you need to move to eight frames. Nowadays, they say they allow you to move to, uh, gradually. You can move to six frames, then to seven, and then to eight, but only within a certain uh, timeline. But basically, what that meant for me was I needed to add 48 frames. And unfortunately, I don't have those kind of finances. And my question was to give up or not to give up. And here we have my good friend, Yoram. And I went to him and I said, I had a dream. I had a dream in the night. It was actually a dream I woke up. And I said, I'm, a, I'm an author. Let me write a story. So I took this, I took this and I had, I was at that point, I was really trying, we were really, my wife and I were trying to have a baby. And we were, we were a little bit desperate. And I said, I have to write this as if I'm telling the story to a child. And David was born, not David Braun, but the David of my story. It's a story. It's all about a young boy, 10 year old, he'll always be 10 years old, <laughs> and was named after King, King David, and the, the kid lives in Jerusalem. And really thank you, Joram, for not, giving, letting, not letting me give up because it has given me years and years of enjoyment. So my concept and concept now is a family member explains about the Holocaust. Another family member explains about the Declaration of Independence and the War of Independence. And another one explains about the 56 War, 67 and 73. Another one explains about terrorism. And another one talks about the peach, the search, the search for peace. So here we have basically the same concept, the same discussions, the same um, ideas, but here I'm telling it in the point of view of the story. When I talk about a family member, such as you'll see it named, um, a Boba is a great grandmother or a grandmother, and she, she will talk and speak in her own words as if she's talking to a child. And it makes it different, it makes it different. Uh, <clears throat> there was one, I remember one, one exhibit similar to this kind of, this kind of thing, uh, somebody did uh, something about a bicycle many, many years ago. Uh, I, had to, I don't remember that exhibit, but someone said they, that uh, that's similar. Um, but I have still a problem. My story is still very, very modern. Basically, even if I talk about the, con the conflict, the, the Holocaust, even if I talk about the mon mandate, the British mandate, we still talk about 100 years. From now, and now it's 1922. We talk about the mandate started 19, 1920, 1921. And when you do and deal with modern with modern material, often the problem is rare material, and the judges don't always know what is rare. I know what is rare in, in what is rare in my in my in my kind of theme, but is with rarity is a problem. I have crash mail, which is very very rare. But some judges will look on it and say that crash mail is not real. And I had that already because American, a lot of American crash mail covers are not very rare. You can buy them without any problem. But to get a 1970 Swiss air crash, and perhaps we'll see an example later, it's not so easy. You, they don't often come up, in, come up in auctions. And there's a difference between unique, one of, one of X amount known, seen, documented, and when you say seen, it's seen by the exhibitor. So you talk about rare material, but if I, and you'll see an example in a moment of something that's basically unique, but it's, there's a thing about scarcity, difficulty of acquisition and importance. <clears throat> An item from 1948, for example, or 1956, it's not as, in, not as important as something that a classic 19th century. So I have a problem. Now here I'm showing you an, ex an example of a, P an, a, Sud a Sudan POW in, in, in Israel in 1948. Now there were only 250 soldiers 
fighting together with the, with the British in 1948. And 25 of them were taken prisoner of war. <clears throat> but this is the only known cover. And I can always say, also say only, only recorded cover, basically, because I'm the only one, I'm the only one I've seen, and the only one I've written about, and it's pretty unique. But is it important? I don't know. Depends who you ask. Another item from the same war. This item, there was, this item was sent from a from an Israeli Israeli POW in Lebanon. Now there are only there are only seven POWs in Lebanon, and there are only eight covers known. And then when I say only eight covers recorded, it's only eight covers recorded because the the the, PR, the Red Cross recorded all the mail, all the numbers of the mail that were there, and mail incoming from Lebanon, there were only eight of them. These do not come up. And both this item and the item before have already been offered at least $1,500 for, meaning that they're not cheap and they are rare, but are they important? But then again, we have this, a classic item, uh, a diaper from, from Egypt from 1880. 1879, a Delarue, Delarue dye proof, and it's already in the classic period. And this is falls into the category of importance. So here we have an item, an item that is of importance. The others, because it's modern material, are lacking in importance. And that is a problem that, that as thematic, modern, thematic exhibitors with modern material, with a modern item, this is where we fall flat. Items that look good. Difficult to get, scarce, uh, difficult of acquisition, but they are not important. <clears throat> now we have see here that the judging criteria of a thematic exhibit. Uh, we here we see here that the, the concept uh, and the, the concept gives you thirty five points. <clears throat> thematic knowledge will give you another fifteen points, and at the presentation you've got fifty five points. The rest of the points is simply material. You have to have good material to improve your philatelic knowledge, the rarity and the condition. And that is where the main challenge, uh, main challenge comes for us uh, as thematics. So how do we, do we introduce a better material? One of the things that any exhibitor has to do is to go to <laughs> exhibitions. And one of the exhibitions, uh, Damien Lager, and uh, it's a pity that he's not here tonight, but he suggested to me to do a prologue. I had no idea what a prologue was, and he then didn't have the time to talk to me about it. But uh, I checked other exhibits out, and I decided, okay, I know what a prologue is. Uh, it's basically an introduction, and I'll give an introduction. By giving an introduction, I can introduce other material, and uh, we'll see what I'm referring to later. So now I have something. I have a prologue. Then I'll add up the past, leading up to the Holocaust, Bible, history, diaspora. Uh, unwelcome, but what about, I've just mentioned Bible, history. Okay, these items we taught at school, okay? But if we taught at school, this is not a member of my family. So I have, I had someone taught to teach in school, a family member about the Holocaust, another one about the different uh, the items that we've spoken about, okay? And that was basically what I was, my concept. So now I have another problem. I need, to move to, I need to move to eight frames. And as we know, another 48 pages. And I'm broke. I don't have money. Because to keep the same amount, the same quality, uh, you need a lot more finances. But Damien Lager had the solution. He started exhibiting at some stage three pages to a row. In other words, you're not defined by A4. A4, you can define how M, the, the size that you want to. So I decided that my, my, my page size was going to be 28 centimeters by 28 centimeters. And that was, that helped me because now it's because as I am, if I had it beforehand 80 pages, and now I only had to add 16 in order to move to eight frames. All of a sudden, that's something that you, that's workable. You can work with that. It's not you don't have to find it throughout the hundred thousand dollars or whatever to, to move to eight frames. And this is my plan. This is my concept. David 
asks his family questions and everyone answers him. And I took icons that and here you see David here, he's got a, a hat. Here in Israel used to call that a covert temple, in other words, the hat of an idiot. And he's a kid. And the, the first chapter about the teacher, it's about a rabbi. And the icons here, the various icons, I took uh, photos of my fair family, my mother, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, all of my family, and I turned them into caricature, caricatures. And I made them a part of my exhibit. None of them are with me anymore. They're all uh, passed away. And, but it gives me a way to, to memorize them, remember them. And here I talk about a continuous approach. Now here we see here, um, Boba, what is the number on your arm on the right hand, on the left hand side? I come back. Okay. And here so in Germany, we witnessed the rise of evil. And those who could not get out went through hell until eventually it came to an end. Now, here I'm basically using the three dots, each one is a subject of it on its own. And the whole thing makes, uh, makes a sentence. So that way I'm breaking, up, uh, breaking it up into sentences, which is part of me telling the story. Even on the page, I use the same continuous approach. Thematic test above each item, that, so that it follows the story. And there's absolutely no repetition. Okay, this is how it goes, right? And if it goes, and with me, basically it has to go in that order. It's something similar to that because in science, I like to be very methodical. But looking at this page, maybe you let me miss this. Now, what is this item? This item is something that maybe many judges will miss. It was in 1946, Austria issued a set of stamps for never forget. Or, and they issued eight stamps for this item. And you see here 12 plus 12, the other 12 was supposed to be paid for the exhibition itself. The problem is that in those days, the allies were basically in control of, of Austria. And they didn't want, they vetoed the stamp. It was printed, ready to be issued, and they vetoed it. Why did they, why did they veto it? Because they didn't want normal, not normal Austrians to be upset by the imagery here. And it was withdrawn from sale. It was withdrawn. The thematic text that I use here is little did we know that death waited, behind, uh, waited us behind his mask. For me, it fits my theme, fits my theme beautifully. I could actually use the same, the same stamp in another place in the exhibit, but this part, when Hitler was uh, hit, uh, coming to power, it suited me perfectly. But if you look at the previous page, it's way down here in the bottom right-hand corner and very easy to miss it. So I add a QR code as well because because there's no room on the page to tell everything about the stamp, all the story behind it, a QR code, QR code, sorry, will allow people to learn more information about it. And also it brings the judge's eyes, hopefully, to that item. What is its QR code? Oh, it's a special item. Let's learn a bit about it. And here we saw, as we saw before, the question. Boba, which is basically, my, in my case, it's the great, a great grandmother. What is that number on your arm? Now, the item below here, I uh, can talk a little bit about this. It's something that even uh, um, Fernando helped me, helped me find here. It's from the inflation period, okay? And I don't remember all the facts about it, but there, it was there, on that day, on that, on the, on that day, the, the rate, was, rate was increased from one, from one billion to 10 billion. And the ten, this is the first day of use of the 10 billion stamp. Now, it was also, uh, it was forced legislation because it also insured. It was insured for 200, $2, trillion or whatever, a, a huge sum of money there. And um, basically this tells the story of the inflation and all the, all the information at the bottom. And this basically tells me that 
money is running out. It's lost all meaning. And that was one of the, one of the causes that led up to the Holocaust or the rise of Hitler, shall we say. And basically, I'm saying here that David is asking, as you can see the icon, and his great-grandmother is answering him, the Boba. And that's basically my concept. And the end, he gets his answer. Now, here we see uh, a person who went through the Holocaust, and you can see his, his tattoo over here in the, in the right, and a baby touching. Basically, a grandfather and a baby, and basically the future, past and the future, basically gives the full, uh, full picture there. And I say there, and so David, the tattoo on my arm is not to remind me, but to remind you. In other words, basically, a person can go and remove a tattoo. It hurts a lot, but people have done it. Not these kind of tattoos, of course, but it keeps them as a reminder to others of the evil that people went through. <clears throat> now we go on to a little bit about innovation and development. So you can see other material. Other material, um, I hope I'm not, uh, yeah, I've still got time. <clears throat> With innovation, innovation is not only a topic, because my topic basically is, sorry, my theme is basically innovative. No one has done anything like this um, and in the way that I've done it. And basically, my approach is, is innovative, but that's not, that's not enough to get, that's not enough. You have to have items that when somebody looks at it, they say, wow, I didn't, didn't realize that that was part of my, that was part of the subject. And we'll see, we'll see examples like that. But getting these items both improves the rarity and Philatelic knowledge, which are both items that I need to get myself up to the large gold. <clears throat> and as I say here, with innovation, not every judge will like the innovation. And uh, fortunately, up to now, I have had judges, most judges like my innovation, and some have uh, frowned at them, or some have frowned at some items, so we should say that. And philatelic knowledge, as I said, is the problem of the thematic because I know my theme very well. I know the Arab-Israeli conflict very well. And uh, we need to keep learning about other, other classes because those are the material that I need to enter and get. Postal rates, for example, uh, roots, uh, classic material. We're to refer to postal rates. For example, the item that I've referred to previously from the um, inflation period in order to exhibit, you have to write everything you know about the rate, because then a judge will say, okay, you know about the material, you know the rate, you know the rate, and you've written up, ah, okay, you've got your, you've got, uh, you've got your um, philatelic knowledge there, that's fine. Problem is you have to do that on almost every item, almost every item, not every item. And you have to introduce classical materials as often as possible. But my theme is modern. This is where philatelic knowledge and innovation meet. Basically, as before, when you write a story, you have to know what you want to say and find the good items. Now, here's an example of what I want to say, and it will... Um, <clears throat> oh. I want to say something like, Lord will guide me. One of the, in Genesis, there's a chapter that says, go forth, okay, go forth to the area that I will, that I will send you to from, I don't remember the exact Bible course, from the, the Nile to the Euphrates and that one. But basically, God is guiding, God is guiding the, the Abraham to the promised land. Now, there's an Israeli council for the, that says go forth for that specific Bible chapter. But is that a good item to use? <clears throat> and basically, no. Maritime mail. Now, what is a maritime mail? It's mail carried by ships. And ships carried markings of QDC or QD Conduso, or meaning may God guide, which basically fits in my theme. And here we see an example. Now, here at the bottom, we see QDC. Now, you can see, and actually the plus here, wait, let's go here, there's a plus here that I haven't marked, which basically says it's been paid for. Now, how did it work there? Maritime mail, in, in this letter was from 16, 
1651, right? I have to look at my notes a moment. The exact date is uh, run away from me. I didn't bring my notes with me, so I'm going to. Oh, wait, sorry. 1689, sorry. 1689. So, 1689, this letter was sent from Acre to, um, to Livorno. Livorno. And it's sent from, sent to uh, Monsieur Francois Venturi. Now, basically, after investigating it, I found that in those days, <clears throat> Maritime Mail, if you mentioned the QDC with the name of the, the captain of the ship, it, mean, it meant basically that it was paid for. It was carried by the captain of the ship. Basically, you see there uh, at the bottom, it says, per captain, uh, cap whatever, Chabano. And um, he was given the mail to carry. and. He was sometimes paid to carry the mail. But the QDC basically is a marking showing that the rate that the, rate, the mail was paid for. When it got to the other side, it was, it was um, sent, in, sent in, the, in the local post or whatever, or carried there by private courier or whatever, but it was paid for. And there's a lot of mail, not so many, in the, in the period of um, uh, 1689, for example, they were about the, uh, 15, there was two covers known from, from, uh, from Acre to Livorno, but there are many, many letters sent to Livorno. Now, why was that? Livorno, basically, Acre was um, a point where they, saw, where they collected cotton to be sent to Livorno in Italy. And this company owned by Venturi, Venturini, had people in the port. And they were the, the merchants and they bought the material and they sent them there. Now, the let, this letter is actually um, some of the the the, the, um, the merchant in in the, in the, in Acre asking him when he's going to get his money. So this kind of item falls in my exhibit. Now, this QDC is not the only not the only one. There are many many other other ones. That's wrote about them here. Um, to my I wrote I did um. Um, a blog about this, so I can send you the blog about the QDC. It's actually very, very interesting. It's QDC, and there's other ones which are very, very similar. Now, <clears throat> this is my wow item. I love this item. It was sent to the Spanish Air Exhibition. Sorry, it was sent to uh, sent to um, a prosecutor or or um, it was sent to a prosecutor at the Spanish Exhibition. Not a person, a consultant, sent a consultant in the Inquisition, was sent in Toledo. And <clears throat> here we see that it was paid in advance, and Al Porto Media, real half a media was paid for, and the plus at the top says it once again that was paid for. The letter from 1575, and this is one of the items that are my favorites. And this item was a, a friend of mine, Yora, who's still here. Yeah? Uh, we, were, we were in um, in Verona in, 19, in 2000 and, uh, 2019, just before uh, the outbreak of Corona, and we were looking at the exhibits, and we saw one one Spanish exhibit there who was uh, exhibiting Columbus, and we basically wanted to see how he was talking about Queen Isabella, because I talk about Queen Isabella uh, the second, sorry, in my exhibit, and how to use it, and we saw an item like this, and we were blown away. And this is exactly the kind of item, kind of time when it's helpful to have somebody with you and go to exhibits to see what there is there. Because when you exhibit in thematics, there's so much you can add. And this is a typical example and something neither of us had thought about in implementing or incorporating because basically we didn't know of the existence of this. Another beautiful item, the Venice Ghetto. Now this is an item from 1762. Now the, the idea, the, the funny thing about the ghetto, the specific one, the Venice ghetto, is that the Venice ghetto was the first ghetto in existence. Now how did the ghetto get, get its name? It has nothing to do with the Nazis, nothing to do with the Germans. Ghetto was an area in Venice. In 1762, Venice was the kingdom of Venice. It was still 
just before Zena, 1760 was already, it was uh, uh, the kingdom of Venice in, 17, in 1760. And the, king, the kingdom said to, to the Jews that they're in danger and they must be put into an area for their own protection, shall we say, for their own protection. And he put a guard around this area. Now this area was, uh, was a place for a steel workers area, which is called a ghetto. Now, basically, well, there were only three, three ways to get in and those three ways to get out. <laughs> but he put, the king put guards out, outside of each of those gates. Theory, Jews had to go into the ghetto at night and they couldn't get out. And the guards were there to, to make sure that no one could leave. In those days, there were uh, Ashkenazi, shall we say, or Jews that came from, from Germany, and they couldn't pronounce the, the word jetta, jetta. So somehow jetta became ghetto, and that is how it became today. The word ghetto comes from the, the, the Venice ghetto. Another part of my exhibit that, that is quite rare to get or quite difficult to get is underground movements. Now, many of people have, people have known about, the, about uh, the history of Israel, know all about uh, uh, Menachem Begin and his uh, antics, shall we say, in the years leading up to the, to, the, um, to the liberation of Israel or the declaration of the statehood. And these, are, these were fighting people fighting against the British. Now, what the British did was at some stage, they rounded up members of these, uh, these uh, groups uh, these underground uh, movements were not really a part of the, shall we say, official group, which was the Haganah, and they rounded them up and sent them to camps. Now, because these were extreme people, some of them were extreme, some of them were not, they sent them into camps not in, not in Palestine, not in Israel. They sent them to camps in places like um, Kenya, sorry, they sent it, yeah, they, they sent it to Eritrea, Sudan and Kenya. And here we have a letter sent to one of these camps in Latrun. Now Latrun is a place not far from, from Israel, not far from Jerusalem. But it was sent from somebody called B. Vinitsky. And the information I had is that B. Vinitsky was in, was in Kenya, a camp called Gilgil. Now this is exactly where Thematic knowledge meets philatelic knowledge. Because there's nothing here that says that it's in Gilgin, that's in Kenya. It was sent by the CID because that's the way, it, that's the way they did it. But it was from a camp to a camp. And the information about Baruch Vanitsky is that he was in, in he was in, in, in he was captured by the British in 1944. He spent time in, in Sudan. He spent time in um, in um, Eritrea and ended up in 1947 and was in Gilgil of Kenya. So this is a this is an item like an item sent from a camp to a camp is very rare. I haven't seen I haven't seen many. But where do we have a problem here? We have a problem here because of the condition. And a judge who will look at this does not know really about the history or whatever, and not knowing that it's rare, also he will drop me marks on condition. So maybe I should uh, put uh, maybe I should put it in a window. I don't know. I'll discuss it uh, with myself and myself. Another item that it, at the first glance doesn't fit into into my theme. It's something called a calamity crash or calamity as we lovingly call it. Now this is the crash cover. It happened in 1948. Just to say that there are very few items known from this crash. The, the, the prices go over $1,000. And it's not really, but it can be, people not know how it fits in. Now, the story is like this. 1948, as you can see, it's December 1948. Um, Czech Airlines, Israel in those days was not getting, was not getting arms for, to fight from anyone. America had an embargo. Um, every, everyone in the world had an embargo. They were just waiting to see what happened and they were not selling. 
Czech, Czech, Czech and Czech was the only country that sold us arms. Obviously, they were given permission by Russia and they sold us arms. At a high price, doesn't matter, but we had bought arms. And Czech Airlines brought these arms to us. In December of 1948, the captain of, this, of the flight, uh, one, of the fly, one of the planes that was carrying was a captain by the name of Volgor, and he hadn't had enough of Czechoslovakia. And he decided he wanted to defect. But he didn't want to defect by himself, he wanted to defect with his entire family. So he arranged with his family that he would arrive on Christmas Eve, 1948, and they would all get on a plane and fly, uh, fly, fly out of Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Now, why, why Christmas Eve? Because in those, in, in Christmas Eve is a time where the airlines are normally empty. Um, people are not flying, they've got where they want to be, and it was an ideal time for him to go. But this is basically talk about 13th of, uh, 13th of, uh, of December. Now, obviously, in those days, it's not like the flights of today that you get on a flight. You're talking about flights from, from, the, from uh, Sao Paulo to Johannesburg, that you say take 12 hours or whatever. That's nothing. That's nothing. 12 hours is nothing. Think about a, a flight from, from, the, from Czech Republic to Israel, which is today it can, it takes about five hours, could take a few days because you have to go from Czech Republic, you have to go to Rome, you have to go from, you have to go from Czech Republic to Budapest, to Rome, then to, to Athens, and only then can you take the last leg. Now, because he was carrying weapons and because he wanted to get back, make the whole trip back, everything had to be done exactly on time. Now, poor, poor Captain Volga is flying his plane and he reaches Athens, he reaches uh, one of the islands and everything was black. There were no lights, nothing. And all of a sudden, he starts saying, he, he thinks he has the engine trouble and he starts saying, mayday, 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 mayday. And Athens Tower heard the mayday. However, at this time, um, Athens, uh, uh, Greece was basically controlled by British, by British, it was 1948, not long after the war. And there were communist insurgents, but they're promoted by Hungary and uh, uh, Hungary and whatever. And the British thought that it was uh, somebody bringing arms to the insurgents, to the communist insurgents, and did not let the British did not let um, Volgar did not let the Athens control tower tell Volgar anything. They were silent, totally silent. Volga kept on going, and all of a sudden, he saw lights come up in front of him, and he said, way, they, they answered my prayers. And he started trying to land, and all of a sudden, he saw that there was a mountain in, in, in front of him. And unfortunately, he couldn't get, he couldn't uh, uh, pull his wheels up enough, and he crashed into the Kalamata mountain. Now, the insurgents managed to climb on board and steal all the weapons, and basically, they, the British gave the, gave the insurgents the weapons. Uh, but fortunately, some materials survived, like this crash cover, and others say it's very difficult to get to, to find. <clears throat> we spoke about the economic boycott earlier. <clears throat> and today we have, uh, we have a nice peace agreement with, uh, with Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, and if we've had exhibits with them. I've met a few of them. I was sitting with them at the same table in, uh, in the Hungary ex exhibit uh, in April, but that wasn't always the case. This is a letter from the Israel Boycott Office in Abu Dhabi, 1973. Now, it was a, it was a quasi government unit. It didn't have, they didn't have to pay for postage. It was sent registered and payment wasn't paid because it was in government now, of this, there's only two known. I haven't seen any others. I don't have both of them. A friend of mine in Australia, Daryl Kibble, has the, has the other one. And um, I can say only, only two seen. When, if another one comes up, I'll be very, very happy. Now, here we have a problem, also another problem with uh, condition. After 1967, um, 
a lot of a lot of Arab a lot of Arabs who previously had cousins, relatives, friends in other Arab countries were unable to to send them letters. The Euro the um, uh, Red Cross was it was useful for sending uh, simple messages. I am fine. Don't worry about me. But for sending letters, that was not good enough. One of the items, one of the one of the traveling companies. Sorry, let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, Moshe Dayan decided on an open border. He said, you, anybody could cross the enemy border. Obviously, you have to get permission first, but you can cross freely and can go, Arabs can go back and forth. And I've got items that, uh, that were, I got permission. I can drive a truck across, I can get a truck. And one of the companies, there was a touring company that decided they were going to do tours of what's called the West Bank. One of those, kind of, one of those com companies was called the Halaby Touring Company. And they purchased a stock of, of uh, Israeli stamps. And at that time, it was one lira 10, and you can see the stamp there. And they bought a stock of them. And they said, anyone in the world, anyone in the Arab, kind of, the Arab uh, region who wants to send letters to friends in, in um, Israel or in the West Bank or Gaza for that matter, can send to them and they will send it. Now this letter was, you can, in the middle you can see, you can see a fold here because basically this was inside another letter. And the way it worked was they folded the letter, they put the letter inside another letter and quite often there was more than one letter and they sent it to this touring company. This touring company then took the, took the letter out, they put the stamp on it and they put their label on it. Their label showed that the, showed that their, their service was paid for. And these are also, the ones with the label are also, once again, very, very difficult to come by. I wanted to replace this, and I've been looking to replace this item for 10 years, and I haven't yet seen one come up uh, for, in the auction. And the condition is such that Shall I use it? Shall I not use it? I'm going to lose points for condition. But basically, the condition is correct for the way it was used. And it was used in, it was crumpled up in inside an envelope with, uh, with um, the, the international reply coupons for, so that they could pay for postage. And that was how they did it. Here we have another cute item, the Caroline affair. Um, now, in 18th, in 1837, uh, America was not exactly friends with British and was not exactly friends with Canada. And a, 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 a revolt broke out in Canada. They also didn't want the British there. And they fled to an island in a steamboat, American steamboat named the Caroline. Now, British then, the, the British then decided to sink the Caroline and throw it overboard. <clears throat> and there was a whole a whole hoo-ha about this, each side willing, and each side blaming the other and saying, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right, you cannot do that. They were not doing anything at that time. Now, the American, American um, uh, Chief of Staff, not, uh, not Chief of Staff, um, Secretary of State by name of, um, of Webster, he sat down with the British and they said, let's discuss this. And they came to an agreement about a law because this is something you can't know that they said is not done. The steamboat, they fled to an island in the steamboat named Caroline, and they were not doing anything. Who gave the who gave the Americans the right to scuttle it, to throw it overboard? They came to a law which is called um, preemptive strike. And the preemptive strike means the need for self-defense. And if you if you over, if you uh, hesitate, you're going to be in big trouble. Now, if we take this back to our time in 1967, Arab countries all throughout the Middle East were saying, we are going to invade Israel. We are going to destroy Israel. They, did, well, they, they turned to Yutan, the head of the United Nations, and they said, please remove your, your peacekeeping forces from our area. We want to invade Israel. Um, the Cairo radio came out and said it'll be a it'll be a war of annihilation with them. And poor Israel was stuck here. And they said we have to we have to attack first. We have to strike first before 
We are attacked ourselves. Now, if you talk, think about logically, if you go into an area and there are 10 people there with, with the weapons or whatever, and you're by yourself, and they come to you and say you're going to kill, they're going to kill you, do you wait for them to kill you before you start uh, firing back? Answer is no. It's the same thing, the preemptive strike. So I started looking for an item with Daniel Webster. And America has items. They have stamps. And basically, I don't want to use stamps because the stamps are boring. And we found this item. Daniel Webster, because he is, because he was a Secretary of State, of the, he was entitled to free franking. Now, free franking, for those of us who don't know, the name of a person or the address of a person is not valid in thematics. I cannot send a letter to Fernando Prata, for example, and say, uh, this is the only known letter sent by me to Fernando Prata. Uh, it's not acceptable. On the other hand, if the name of the person entitles that person to have to be free of franking, then it's valid for usage. And Daniel Webster had free franking permission. And that makes it valid in thematic exhibits. And this turns, this turns thematic knowledge together with philatelic knowledge and gives me a nice item. I spoke earlier about the Swiss air bomb, and I've shown the wrong cover here. <laughs> I'm showing the cover from the Kalamata crash. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, the Swiss air bomb was another bomb in 1970 and very difficult to get. Oh, Anyway, now we have another item. I want to talk about land theft. Now, many times you hear about. Uh, um, Palestinians saying that Israel stole land. And there's no, no documentation of, of where it is. There's no, nothing that speaks about it. And I found this item. Now, here we see, <clears throat> excuse me, here we see um, a cancel, which says here, remember the a million, the million um, Palestinian refugees who left in, who left in uh, May the 15th, 19, 1948. The problem is that this was issued in May of 1965, five years later. What has it got to do? This cancel was this slogan, sorry, it was initially issued for the World Refugee Year. Now, the truth of the matter is that this was reissued in 1965 for, for um, Palestine, for the commemoration of the, of the theft of Palestinian land. So I can use that because that was the, the, the that was the, the reason for reissuing this slogan because it was reissued for for um, um, another commemoration for a, for a conference of the theft of Palestinian land. And now we're going to talk about a little bit about the price of peace. Now, as you know, as price of peace, uh, one of the things that Israel did was we gave we we gave back land. We gave land to, to Egypt when we signed the peace treaty. And this is an example of an item that was sent to, um, to the Gaza Strip, not the Gaza Strip, to Yamit. And Yamit was one of the, one of the areas that we gave back to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to Egypt. Now, Yamit itself was, uh, was a struggle because we already had many, many people there and the people in our met were very, very anti uh, giving, giving it back. Um, but we knew we had to. <clears throat> and it received, received um, very, very rare cancellation. The settlement destroyed, returned to sender. Now, this is basically only one of two known. And only one basically that's been written about and not by me. Uh, both of them are from the same, from the same, uh, from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, from the, from the, 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 the Museum of Jer the Jerusalem Museum, sorry, the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. They're both from there. And maybe it was at a time when they didn't realize it and someone was just writing it out quickly just to send it out. But it's uh, very, very difficult to find. Mm -hmm. Rare, scarce, all of the above. 
I'll talk a little bit about an innovation that I told you that you can add other items. Um, do I have still have time? Do I still have time, people? No one says yeah, no, then I'll continue. Yeah, yes, we're good. Still? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay. I'm talking about the story of our deliverance from slavery in Egypt. All of us know that if we live, know the Bible, that um, we left Egypt, we were slaves in Egypt, and we came to the promised land. And it was God who brought us out of it. It was God who the story about deliverance was when God brought us out of them. What can I use to show deliverance? Balon Monte. Now, the last deliverance balloon left Paris in December 1870, and it fits my fits it perfectly because it is about deliverance. In this case, it's deliverance out of Paris, out of Paris, but it's a nice item to use. And here we can see they were sent from the uh, Rue de Enguien here on the, uh, on the right in the cancer here, but also we can see it in the stamp. In those days, uh, the number four was for that specific post, uh, post office. I use this and it's a nice item to, to use. Another lovely item that I want to show here is I'm saying we were hanged. Now, I spoke to you about the, the British and the, the underground movements and that we were sent to, um, to camps in, um, in, in, in Africa, such as uh, Eritrea, Sudan, and Kenya, but some of them were sentenced to death. Now, how does this how does this work? I can use this. Now, here we have three. We have two symbols and something here that says "Cheeto, Cheeto, Cheeto." Now, this was a, a Venetian courier from I don't remember from 1506. I think it's the oldest item in my in my exhibit. 1506. <clears throat> "Cheeto, Cheeto, Cheeto" basically means "Rapido, Rapido, Rapido." In other words, very, very quick. We also have here. Uh, what's called uh, what looks like a stirrup. In other words, not only must it be very very quick, but the person could change uh, could change horses. He had a, he was allowed one change of horses. Every every one of those uh, things that look like a hanger in a closet uh, were uh, basically a change of horse. Sometimes you see some two, sometimes you see three. It depends how urgent it was. But the nicest thing here is this item here which is basically a hangman. In other words, what they're saying here is, what they're saying there is, don't tamper with the mail. If you touch the, if you touch it, you'll be hanged. And this was by order of the Venetian king. Now, once again, talk about 1967 and how we managed to, against all odds, uh, managed to win that war. And this, some of our maneuvers were taught in military academies. Now, how, what kind of a military academies do we have? <clears throat> we have West Point. And by putting in this item from 1853, I managed to add a nice item into my exhibit, three innov innovation. Now, five, five cents here in the DC here was for up to 300 miles. And West Point was quite near New York. But once again, I can add an, a nice item that people don't normally think belong there. Disinfected mail. This is also um, sent to Livorno, and I think it's also sent to the same person, Benawi, Benizli, Benizli. And here I can say, we will treat us as if we were a disease. That way, I've been, by using a thematic text, I can introduce uh, something that people say, what is that? Why is it here? What do we talk about in, in, a, in a disinfected mail here? This is actually sent from Aleppo to Livorno. I want to also talk about the, the, the problem of the refugees, for example, is the heart of the, the problem. Heart of the problem with the, with the Palestinians, heart of the problem with the end. So I want to introduce something with the heart. So here I introduce something very, very nice. This is, this is from, this is what's called the Dokra Penny Post. Now, after the, after the, the, um, the fire, the great, the, the, after the Black Death, people were penniless, they didn't have much. And 
they wanted to, they didn't have much, a lot of money and people were charging a lot of money for sending mail. Along comes Dokra and he says he's going to charge one penny. And the way it worked was that <clears throat> you sent it to his eye, to his eye, to his, um, to his area. You only had to pay, you only had to pay a penny for anything it was in, for example, for London. Now, if we have a look at the heart, you can see the heart here. Uh, the heart here, it says here, F for Friday and AFT for Friday afternoon. This was only in use for about 12 years and only on Friday afternoon. So there are not very many known. April 25 was basically the, the foreign, foreign office um, incoming bishop mark. Now, if people know, most of us know what a bishop mark is. A bishop mark basically is something that only has the date. Only has the date. It's normally uh, April. It's only the country, the, 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 the um, uh, month and the date. And you can only see within the letter when the actual date was. And this was used for many, many years. This way I was able to, and this basic letter was sent from, from Paris. That's why it has the foreign, uh, uh, foreign office. I wanted to talk about the 29th of November, and we already just spoke about uh, the bishop mark, and here I have the 29th of November bishop mark. Now this is some kind of, this kind of innovation, um, specifically the 29th of November, some judges will say that they like it, some judge will say it's too far fetched. It depends on the judge. Another thing that I thoroughly enjoy the typographic cancel. Um, a typographic cancel was a cancel, a stamp that was printed on the paper. And you can see here on the paper over here. And the newspaper was printed on top of the paper. Basically, it was the printing of the newspaper. The print that cancelled that stamp, that cancelled that specifically that two franc stamp. Now here we have a different, another cancel. Now this is simply because the two filling or the two, the two uh, franc, the two cent times was for local mail, and had to for anything out of that area was was four, was operated by four centimes. Now the two centime franc or rate was for um, newspapers that were dealing with political issues or social economy. And that was what the Journal of Hope was all about. Now, I'm using this because of the word l'espoir. L'espoir means hope. So because of the, because the typographic cancel is just here under the, under the stamp or on top of the stamp, I find it legitimate to be able to use this. Nearing the end, and um, my friend Yoram gave us a similar speech um, about a month ago. And basically, I'm just going to say that my friend Yoram has reached a large goal. He is there where I want to be, uh, and, but hopefully one day soon. But there's no one way to do well. Okay. Um, you, some, as I say, some, some uh, subjects are very, very difficult. If you take a subject like flowers, maybe maybe with with um, with prephilatelic mail, you have a lot of material. Uh, but with a modern modern time, modern material, it's very very difficult to fit items to your theme. And it does help to find people who can help you. And we, my support group is Yora, and a few, <laughs> and he helps me. Sometimes I, I think I think about something, and Yora says, "No, it's too far fetched." Mm -hmm. Or Yora will say to me. It's good, and let's go for it. And then I start doing it. Anyway, that's my story, or shall I say David's story. And if anyone wants to look at uh, my, my uh, YouTube channel, there's the QR code. And as I say here, I'm starting a postcard exhibit. I'm going to talk about the Jewish stereotype, a single frame. And if anyone sees anything, you know, just send me a message. All right, thank you for listening. Now we'll have answers before the questions or questions before the answers. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. That was really great, the way that you presented it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lawrence, for the presentation.
Yeah, we I'll can take some sharing. questions for for Lawrence. Stop the show. Okay, Lawrence will answer questions. I got I, one. Go ahead, Luis Fernando. Lawrence, thank you very much. How, this is the only. This is the first one, but I I guess could be the only one. How old are you? How old am I? Yes. Sixty-two. Only. Yes, sixty-two. Ah, oh, you thought I was older. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> to know so much about what is needed to be know uh, uh, on thematics, you look like uh, seventy years old. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I look like seventy years old uh, because uh, of uh, knowledge. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I was going to go home and cry. <laughs> I, I was worried that you were referring that thematic age you, so choose something different. <laughs> no, uh, if, if, if you allow me, Henry. Sure, go ahead. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to say thank you again to Lawrence because what he has um, what he has shown us today and the way he talks about material only reinforces what I have been doing in, in our previous talks. Yeah. I've been talking of exactly about this uh, theme. I'm probably following the same method you did for, I don't know, months and months. I have about uh, not, not less than six or seven talks in this same YouTube channel regarding what you what you talk today so i have to say thank you thank you thank you uh you, 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 you reinforce what 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 i've been trying to to show as well uh i was supposed to be in budapest i couldn't i couldn't get there um i, I was i was a member of the jury but i had to go to the hospital for uh hard condition not 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 the worst but i had i couldn't get there so i miss your your exhibit i hope in the future i can i can see it i hope that i'll be able to exhibit in ibra in uh, may i hope so. i i will be there but i don't know if i'm not gonna be in the jury it doesn't matter i can take you around uh, my exhibit and you that should also be probably out. better that would be probably better and uh, you should also check out uh, my friend Joran's exhibit because it's uh, it's good, very, very good. Thank you. Lawrence, I have a, a couple of questions, but let me start with the, First maybe the, the hardest one. Um, it depends who you ask, of course. This could be a very controversial, controversial topic. And there are going to be many different point of views, and they, they could have valid points or not. That, that is independent. So just to have the courage to develop something in a, in a way that is basically just telling one of the potential many different point of views, I guess is very uh, commendable to say. So congratulations for that, because you, you tell really a compelling story. This is nothing that was created by the Jewish people or other people. These are things that are coming forever and the way that uh, from a very long time. And, and, and what I found really important to, to emphasize that part is when you touch on the innovation, because when you started talking about those pieces that are so far out from the actual time that we are living now, or the, the things that bubble things up to the point that um, make it more controversial, you, you go back to the roots of the story that even though it's tangent, it highlights some of those, those areas, right? So that I, I thought that that's that's beyond innovation, I guess, is, is a very good strategy just to, to soften the, the topic. So that, that's great. Now, in, in that part, how, when, you, when you presented your, your exhibits, have you received any feedback from the judges that, that you can share with us related to that innovation? Because it takes time to really grasp what the intention of that all material really is. And maybe the judges just walking through your exhibit for 10, 20 minutes 
may not get that. So anything that you can share with us in, in that aspect? Yeah, here's actually where the problem lies because um, I'm showing sure material that many, many judges will just walk past, as you said. Um, yes. And many judges do skip by it because as an example, I, say, I have that, that, um, that small Hitler skull that it's in the, in the bottom corner and it's a small stamp and judges will miss it. I also have another item which I didn't show. This war is a Jewish war, uh, which is, uh, I also use that. And there are many items like that that's it. And so as far as, as, far as um, uh, judges' comments were concerned, I've had very, very little comments. Uh, one comment I did, did have was about the 29th of November, Bishop Mark, that one judge said to me that they didn't like it, it's far-fetched, but that was one judge's uh, opinion. I try with my innovation to um, write it in the synopsis, the, the good items. I write a synopsis and I try to put in there, okay, you have to know that there's a special study here and there's this item here from 1506 or whatever. I write that in my synopsis. Whether judges read it or not, I have no idea. Yeah. But, but um, uh, a few judges have seen my entire exhibit and uh, those that have, like it obviously um look um some judges must like it because um, at the moment i'm with 93 points and uh, special prize for treatment it's just a question of getting to the 95 so with 95 it's basically to get better material now it's something i'm working on now taking out uh, bad pages and putting in better i'll give you an example of two pages that i'm uh, dealing with now um <clears throat> Very nice conference. He has to leave. Bye. I'm adding a page or add the page about um, the, Fr the French German um, conflict because uh, Napoleon invaded, invaded Prussia and controlled Prussia. And uh, in 1870, the same thing happened, but the opposite direction. Um, France, uh, France attacked, uh, sorry, uh, 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 France attacked uh, Prussia. But there was a conference like Belon Monte and all kinds of things. And I have an item uh, to talk about another item there in a moment. And then again, in what happened in, in the World War II. And then at the end, I say, okay, there's a lot of conflict here. And but we could, uh, today, Germany and France are very good friends. They're almost brothers and sisters, shall we say. Now, I use that page by introducing good materials such as. Um, uh, Papillon de Metz, as an example. I use it by uh, the Napoleon's Grand Army. And another item, I spoke, uh, my, one of the YouTubes, one of my latest YouTubes, uh, my, my latest YouTube is about Papillon de Metz. So that's one page which I get in earlier, Mertion. And if you think about it, um, it's, it's part of the conflict that, uh, that I can say, okay, even though we're, we've been enemies for a long time, Enemies can become friends. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that at the end, so that there is hope because enemies can become friends. <clears throat> That's one page that I'm building to, to do. Another page is the, the, the subject of, of nationalization in 1870s. Uh, Germany became, was separated. There was, there was Prussia and uh, many other countries, Bayern, and same with Italy. So the, all of a sudden, these countries came together and uh, became a single country because they all spoke the same language, which is basically what one of the catalysts for the Zionist movement. So it's another page that I can, end, that I can use to get more material. And it's not really kind of innovation. And if uh, sometimes I say to myself, why didn't I think of it before? <laughs> so that's, that's some things that I'm trying to do that maybe judges look at that and see it's not a modern material. I'm trying to do a lot more work getting classic material. And maybe one day I'll get the, uh, the, the large gold. <laughs> what is the next show you are exhibiting? Uh, Ibra. Hopefully Ibra. Ibra. Hopefully. Ibra. Oh, okay. Ibra, hopefully, because it's, um, there are many exhibitors there, many exhibits that uh, uh, hopefully if I do go, hopefully I'll meet Fernando there. He's also threatening to go there. Uh, but uh, I don't know if, uh, and for me, for me, it all depends on uh, whether I'm allowed to go from uh, by my daughter, my daughter and my wife. 
I, I have a five-year-old daughter, so I have to uh, look after her, sometimes take her to, to uh, school. But we'll see. I'm working on my wife now. Good, she good. Started already. <laughs> All right. You had a few questions. Yeah, my, my second question was related more to you. Have you collect anything else other than your thematic exhibit? Um, the truth is, I don't have that kind of finance anymore. I used okay. to. I I my, my I sort of as the propaganda, and my my Arab propaganda is the field that I love, and all the time I love it. I, I love it. I love it to bits. Another thing I like is post creek and uh, which uh, which I I like doing, but I can't have, unfortunately I can't afford to buy it to collect everything I want to. Uh, so I, this is this is where I put my money. So I sell items to buy new items. It's all a question of finances, uh, resources. Uh, yeah, I, I get it, and because I I noticed some of the material you have are outstanding postal history items like that label you show uh halibi i guess together with the uh, israeli stamp i never yeah. seen anything like that but i can imagine and, and you you made a comment you are looking for a better one but you know the way it is even if it was here on the side or whatever those things are extremely rare and if someone questions condition there i I will question their question because that's what it is, you know, is I don't know. But here, here we have a problem where a judge is 20 minutes and he says, okay, that doesn't look good, but he doesn't look, uh, look there to see why it's not good. He will not uh, yeah, exactly. get close. And I cannot blame the judge because he only has a short time, he has to go through, and he will say, okay, the conditions here not, is not good. So if you, when you see an item like that, on the one hand, it's an excellent item, you want the person, judge to see it, on the other hand, he says the condition's not good. It's a nice item. Yeah. Condition. I, so it's uh, question. Uh, I made this comment in yesterday's talk, and I will repeat it here again, because basically it's the same commonality, right? I, I heard in a couple of presentations here in the office and somewhere else that a term called Swiss quality. So if everything is going to be so pristine, you know, come on, give me a break. That's not reality. Reality is circumstances like the piece that you show us, maybe one, two, and all the trouble just to get to a point that, okay, shows the, the scarf of the, the road. Would that be penalized compared with something that is so expensive, but maybe there are a lot and they try to create layers for the commercial? Um, I, I don't know. I still don't get that, and probably I will never digest that term, and I will fight it for because <laughs> it is not fair. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, any anyone else? I, I I would like to know about that piece, the the one yeah. you you were wondering if putting on in 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 a window or not, the one which was yes damaged. yes yes the uh, piece the piece was sent between two two camps, an underground yes. mail set from from, from yes from yes yes yeah. what you did with that? Oh, it's a part of my exhibit. It's there. Exactly as it is. Exactly as it is. Yes. You 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 never send it to restoration. Are you going to send it? Have you? I, done it I never thought about to send it for restoration because the um, the rust marks are on the front. So when you start sending things for restoration, uh, I don't know. I no, I, don't I, I don't mean replacing part of no, paper. No, 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 Just no, 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 cleaning. I'll, 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 I'll think about it. So it's a good point. We'll see. Yeah, because because a window is not a, a choice, not at all. In thematics, we use it actually quite a lot. Mm. <laughs> so so question of that maybe for you, Luis Fernando. So is restoration accepted by the jury? As... I, I do accept not. Not not replacing paper, not writing over the paper, but cleaning and and disinfecting is in some cases a must. Not crash uh, letters, right, right, no, right. never crash letters, but but uh, 
things like that one, I, I, I would probably do my own. Okay. But let's say restoration within a grade, right? Nothing that goes so extreme as you were yeah. saying, replacing paper. Yeah, and the other thing is it, it, it all depends on, on what the, the owner of the exhibit is writing, his his own writing. What what's right. what's what what he thinks about or let let's say this. Uh, Lawrence said most of the pieces he showed, he said they are unique or two or less known. Okay, that should be written down in every page, in every case. But he shouldn't allow the other judges or judges or public to, to get in conflict regarding a piece if it is not uh, uh, unique or not. He should say, we should say, we should, we all. Uh, I, I, I have a final comment, but just remark, Go regarding ahead. the regarding the bishop mark or the bishop marks uh it, it, and it, I, i'm gonna mention this because it is completely related to why what i was saying regarding what is going to be written i i heard some hesitance from lawrence when he was showing this piece and it shouldn't be the bishop mark is the first cds mark in the world and and that should be said uh, 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 as part of the text describing the piece. Um, the, the hesitant was only because um, in Hungary, no, sorry, in Verona, one of the judges said that it's uh, far fetched, uh, the 29th November, and uh, I haven't. I'm leaving it in because I. Uh, it's, it's one judge. <laughs> You know, you, every judge has the opinion. In Verona? Is that judge's opinion? Wondered the name. I'm not... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Any any other questions? Oh, Mauricio, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, uh, for the presentation. And first of all, greetings from Honduras. And just wanted to congratulate you. Very nice, very interesting. I know I will have to watch it again just to be familiar with everything that you have said and taught us today. And once again, thank you very much. Another. All right. De nada, no, de mucho. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can say something, sure. also again to congratulate you, Lawrence. I already saw your, your exhibit, it's amazing. Uh, well, uh, I know that you're working now for the large goal uh, well be uh, just relaxed and eventually it will come but i know that you're making a great effort uh, with the new the knowledge you already show us you will manage to do it thank you well done. awesome with all those best wishes so we look forward to see your exhibit in person and thanks again for for the presentation thank you very much for inviting me thank you thank you thank you y el día de mañana